33. Outlaw. If a Christian is under the law as a rule of life, he is labouring in a doleful, grey, alien land of self-righteousness. He struggles to produce. The believer who learns to walk in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has the joy of the Lord for his strength, and he rests to receive. Instead of our Father demanding from us according to the law, by grace he ministers to us from the one who is our life in glory. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. So first we look at the law and the new nature. Our new nature is that of the risen life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The purpose of the law being to reveal sin and condemn the sinner. It has nothing to say to the new man in Christ Jesus. Romans 6.14 says this. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law but under grace. First, as each of us was separated from the Adam life by means of the cross and the tomb, we were delivered from the realm of the law. We rose from the tomb into newness of life, out of the grip of law into the freedom of his resurrection. Now we are discharged from the law and have terminated all intercourse with it, having died to what once restrained and held us captive. So now we serve not under or in obedience to the old code or the written regulations, but under obedience to the promptings of the Holy Spirit in newness of life. Romans 7 verse 6. Secondly, law has to do with works, the works of the flesh. The new creation has to do with life and the life of the Son. Abiding in him, our nature will grow and manifest the fruit of the Spirit. In Romans 7 verse 4 we read, You have undergone death as to the law through the crucified body of Christ, so that now you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Next we look at the Christian and the new nature. Our Lord Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand in glory, is not under law of any kind. His life is subject neither to commands nor to the principle of law. It is holy by nature. And we, having been born into him, now share his life. For me to live is Christ. Philippians 1, 21. First, the wages of sin being death, the law by the execution of death penalty, exhausted its right over man in Adam. Having died to the law in Christ, the law no longer has any claim on the believer. He is now free from its reign. We read in Romans 7 verse 9, When the commandment came, sin lived again, and I died or I was sentenced by the law to death. And in Galatians we read, For through the law I died to the law, that I might live to God. Galatians 2 verse 19. Secondly, being in Christ Jesus, the believer no longer has need for the law as a governing principle. He can now live by nature effortlessly and naturally. We read in Romans 8 verse 12, we are debtors but not to the flesh. We are not obligated to our carnal nature to live a life ruled by the standards set up by the dictates of the flesh. And three, when the believer sees his deliverance from the old, he can begin to walk in the freedom of the new. 
In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 17, we read, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And in Galatians 5, 13, we read, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. So now we look at walking in liberty. Some of the positive results of walking in liberty are as follows. There are six points. First, even when there is failure, the abiding believer learns from it and gains thereby. He knows that his father is working all things together for his good and to conform him to the image of his son. We read these in Romans 8, 28 and verse 29. His reliance is neither on the law nor the flesh, but on the Holy Spirit, so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 4. Secondly, instead of struggle to keep from sinning, and self-effort to progress spiritually, he rests in Christ, the ground of growth. The word of God is his daily sustenance, and he feeds on it in reliance on its author, the spirit of truth. Third, prayer is his cherished fellowship with the Father. He depends on the spirit for this most vital aspect of his life. We read in Romans 8, 26 and 27, that the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for, as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Fourth, having learned to hate the old life, he willingly judges himself. He confesses his sins fully and without fear because he loves and trusts his advocate and redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Five, in his growth, he is more and more free from the influence of indwelling sin and the old life, the law, and the surrounding world. He is at rest concerning himself, but burdened for others. His service is from the heart and in the spirit. It is a sharing of life. He does not have to resort to human methods and fleshly means to win others and to help them grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. He allows the Holy Spirit to control and to work through him by means of life, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And six, underlying whatever service the Spirit may lead him into, his most important and effective ministry is simply to be. For to him to live is Christ. He becomes an example or a pattern to the believer, a pattern to the lost, in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith and in purity. 1 Timothy 4 verse 12. His attitude is that of Paul. In Galatians 5 verse 1, where we read, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage or the yoke of law. My liberty from the old is infinite in the Lord Jesus, limited only to the glory of the Father and to the good of others. 34. The World and Its Prince Continuing the consideration of that from which Christ has freed us, this chapter will deal with two of our deadly enemies, the world and Satan. 
First, the world. Satan is the god and prince of this present evil world system. We see this in John 12, 31 and 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. The world is the chief weapon by which Satan ever seeks to cripple the Christian. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but of the world. 1 John 2, 16. And the whole world lieth in the wicked one. 1 John 5, 19. So first we look at the worldly Christian. It is in the environment of this world that the Adam nature is at home and flourishes. The believer who is dominated by the old nature is bound to be worldly. He feels that he can live for God effectively on a carnal level. He imagines that such a manner of life and service will attract the world to an unworldly saviour. Others go to the opposite extreme by attempting to live for God through legalistic measures. But this is resorting to the wrong realm of life. We read, If then you have died with Christ to material ways of looking at things and have escaped from the world's crude and elemental notions and teachings of externalism, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to rules and regulations such as do not handle this or do not taste that? Do not even touch them, referring to things all of which perish with being used. To do this is to follow human precepts and doctrines. We read in Colossians 2 verses 20 to 23 the following. Such practices have indeed the outward appearance that popularly passes for wisdom. In promoting self-imposed rigour of devotion and delight in self-humiliation and severity of discipline of the body. But they are of no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh, the lower or the old nature. Instead, they don't honour God, but serve only to indulge the flesh. Fleshly means are futile, whether utilised to win the world or to avoid the world. Whenever passes as a cloud between the mental eye of faith and things unseen, causing the brighter world to disappear, or seem less lovely, or its hope less dear, this is our world, our idol, though it bear affection's impress or devotion's air. Next, we look at the Christ-centred Christian. The risen Lord Jesus is the abiding place and environment of our new nature, and it is in that life that we are to walk, for our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3 verse 20. It is there, abiding above, that we fellowship and grow, and it is from there that we minister here in this lost and needy world, Although we are in the world, we are not of it. We are primarily here in order for God to be glorified in us and the Lord Jesus to be manifested through us for the sake of others. Conduct yourselves properly, honourably, righteously among the Gentiles, so that although they may slander you as evildoers, yet they may be witnessing your good deeds which are come to glorify God. 1 Peter 2 verse 12 To escape from the rain and the corroding influence of the world, we must count on the work of the cross, by which we were crucified to the world and the world was crucified to us. Galatians 6 14 The source of our Christian life is neither in the worldly nature nor in the worldly system we are to look to another world for all of our reservoirs. If or since then you have been raised up with Christ, keep on seeking the things above, whereby Christ is seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are here on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3 verses 1 to 3. We now look at Satan. Both the cross and the risen Lord Jesus separate us from the reign of Satan. At Calvary we died out of his kingdom of darkness and death. And in the resurrection we were born into the Son's kingdom of light and life. In Colossians 1 verses 12 and 13 we read the following. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. And so, with respect to Satan, we're going to look at three areas. To resist Satan, to stand in our position, and to rest. First, resist. Satan would seek to bluff us out of our position of safety. But we are to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. And neither give place to the devil. Ephesians 4, 27. And submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James 4, verse 7. Our resistance to the enemy is on the basis of faith. Faith in the work of the cross in which he was doomed and his power was broken. Through our reckoning, his defeat at Calvary is applied and we are made to triumph. Satan, although dangerous, has been defeated. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. And in Hebrews 2, verse 14, we read the following. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy and make of no effect him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Next we are to stand. We are to stand in our position hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3 verse 3. That we may be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Ephesians 6 verse 10. We do not have to wage war with the devil to obtain our position, nor do we have to fight him either to maintain it or to retain it. We simply stand where we have been placed, abiding above, resisting his assaults and the fiery darts through faith in the victor, the one who defeated him and all his cohorts. At the cross, the Lord Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2.15 And so we humbly walk in the train of his triumph. And finally, rest. Many believers not knowing of or abiding in their position in the triumphant Lord Jesus Christ, attempt to war against and defeat the devil and his demons. Before long, Satan looms larger and stronger in their eyes, while the Lord Jesus seems to become smaller and weaker. Soon, they imagine there are demons on every hand, possessing nearly everything and everybody. They become obsessed with their warfare, and before long begin to experience defeat and break down in the physical, the mental, moral and the spiritual realms. 
If Satan can get the believer to become more aware of him than of the Lord Jesus, the inevitable result is a triumphant foe and a defeated Christian. Our responsibility is to stand fast and resist the enemy by quietly resting in our impregnable position in Christ. We read in Colossians 2 verses 9 and 10 that In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And in Romans 13 verse 12 we read the following. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armour of light. Our Father often uses the enemy as a foil to teach us to handle our weapons of defence. We are told to put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, in Ephesians 6 verse 11. Actually, the Lord Jesus is our armour, for we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh, in Romans 13 verse 14. Satan cannot touch him, and nor can he touch us in him. Even when our father chooses to let out Satan's chain a little, the enemy's worst only proves to be God's best for the believer who stands his ground in Christ. Satan thought he was destroying the Lord Jesus on the cross. And now he attempts to do the same with the believer. But all he gets is a mouthful of ashes, his Calvary defeat. All he gets is judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. John 16 verse 11. I am thankful that the cross has closed my history as related to the world and its prince. I was a slave to the world, but now it's crucified to me and I to it. Galatians 6, 14. I was a slave to Satan, but now my father has made me a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light and delivered me from the power of darkness. Colossians 1, verses 12 and 13. 35. Transplantation. We would seek to encourage the believer by explaining the way in which our Father uses the old sinful life to establish in us the new righteous life. By faith we stand in the work of the cross for the Spirit's opposition to all that would hinder our growth. And by faith we abide in the Lord Jesus for the Spirit's accomplishment of that growth. We stand and he works. And so we look at progress. First, the downward progress. Before we can grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, as we read in Ephesians 4 verse 15. Before we can do that, there must be a growth downward. A sturdy root system must be established. Naturally and spiritually, the underlying development comes first. The superstructure is dependent on a solid, subterranean foundation. Usually the believer is awakened and then hungered for true spiritual growth by an increasing awareness of the virulence and, and the power of the old nature. Most Christians struggle for years in the vain attempt to control indwelling sin. The result is an up and down life, a, a defeated spiritual life. A portion of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 11 can give us a valuable light here. We read, Always delivered unto death. 
One of the most effective but heart-rending applications of the death of the life of the believer is his realisation of the sinfulness and the strength of the flesh. The story of the reign of this death-dealing nature overcoming the believer is entitled Romans chapter 7. Sooner or later the Christian discovers that despite the fact that he is a new creation in Christ, he does not have the strength to overcome this old sin nature, the nature that would ruin his life and his testimony. On and on goes the losing battle, year after weary year. In Romans 7 verse 19, this is what we read. For I fail to practice the good deeds I desire to do, but the evil deeds that I do not desire to do are what I am ever doing. Liberating light. But in time, in God's time, the Holy Spirit begins to enlighten the failing believer as the real truth about the reign of sin. We read in Romans 7.20, now, if I do that that I would not, it is no more I, as a new creation, that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. This enlightenment is the beginning of the end of the reign of sin in the believer. The awakened Christian realises that he does not have to submit to the indwelling source of sin, and that it is now an alien realm to him. He has a new sphere of life in which to abide. He can submit to the old source. He can choose to walk in its ways. He can, by carelessness, be overcome by its power. But he need not, and he should not. Some of the believer's sinful cooperation with the old nature is due to his inability to distinguish clearly between the workings of the old and those of the new. But the sad failure teaches him to recognise and repudiate the old man for what it is. His realised need develops his discernment and appreciation of the Lord Jesus' life within. A turning point. The Holy Spirit uses the pressure and process of death within to prepare for the development of the resurrection life. The believer sees that the sin and carnality so often experienced is now produced by the old nature and certainly not by the new. He begins to value his freedom to reject the sin producing nature by the work of the cross, to reckon himself to have died to the old man. Death now separates the old from the new. Philippians 3 verse 3 says this, For we are the circumcision, separated from the flesh, which worship God in spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. This should be an encouragement. Our growing hatred of the works of the flesh ultimately causes us to stand clear in our liberated position in Christ. He gives us freedom by means of the cross and growth by the law of the spirit of life. Now we know who is who. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. John 3 verse 6 the old man will never change. The old man will ever be sinful and produce nothing but death. Hence it must be cultivated and not coddled. We are to have nothing to do with the old and everything to do with the new. For neither is circumcision now of any importance, nor uncircumcision, but only a new creation 
the result of a new birth and a new nature in Christ Jesus. Galatians 6 verse 5 Everything apart from our new life has been fully dealt with and condemned at the cross. Thank God we are new creations in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away in death, and all things are become new in Christ. These are the two basic truths that we are to lay hold of. We have been freed from the old and can turn from it to give our full love and attention to him who is the source of the new. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 It is normal for the believer to want to grow up in the Lord Jesus, to become more like him, but he does not at first realise how much his upward development depends on a deep and a solid root system. This the Spirit accomplishes by making us aware of our fleshly life within and the sin of our alliance with it. By such negative means he brings us to the place of humility. Thus we learn the necessity of complete dependence on the Spirit of God, the Son of God, the Word of God and our Heavenly Father who is the Husbandman. We are being rooted and grounded for growth. So having looked at the downward progress, we now look at the upward progress. When the Holy Spirit has our root system well enough established, when we begin to exercise faith in the dying of the old life by the cross, and when we learn enough of the sin and the danger of trafficking with the Adamic life, then it is that he turns our faith to the true vine. We read in Ephesians 6, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In general, Christians focus upon the death of the Lord Jesus. He died for me. But for the growing believer, his life must be the focal point of our faith. In Colossians 3 verse 4, we read Christ who is our life. He is the justification of life, we read in Romans chapter 5 verse 18. Emphasis on his death gives assurance of the new birth. But what the believer needs is growth. Growth comes from life, from resurrection life. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Philippians 3 verse 10. My position is in him at the Father's right hand. And it is there that I find life and fellowship. Christians who dwell mainly on his death know little of life, of his life. Looking on him as our life, the Holy Spirit enables us to exchange the old for the new. We read in Colossians 3 verse 10, And have put on the new man, which is renewed, that's recreated, and have put on the old man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. In Ephesians 4, 24, that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In this risen position, hidden and resting in the Lord Jesus, I am on the ground of growth, free to grow up in him. Oh, we read in Galatians 4.19, my little children of whom I travel in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Dead and crucified with thee, passed beyond my doom, sin and law forever silenced in thy tomb. Passed beyond the mighty curse, dead from sin set free, not for
for the earth's joy and music, not for me. Dead, the sinner past and gone, not the sin alone. Living where thou art in glory on thy throne. Oh, if I unselfishly cultivate the old ground, there will be nothing but a grim harvest of wood, hay and stubble. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Galatians 6 verse 8. But if I sacrificially cultivate the new ground, there will be an eternal life-giving harvest. For unless a grain of wheat fall to the earth and dies, it remains alone. It remains just one grain. It remains by itself alone. Oh, but if it dies, we read in John 12, 24, but if it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. 36. The process of confirmation. While the ground of growth is celestial, the realm of the development and manifestation of the growth is terrestrial, earthly. We are to abide in our Lord Jesus there, in order to grow and become fruitful here. Branches in the inverted vine. In the foregoing chapters, we've sought to establish the ground of truth on which we're to stand. Now we need to see that truth is made practical in our daily life and service. But let us first mention three of the principal reasons why many believers fail to live in the new life that is theirs in Christ. There's lack of knowledge, misapplied knowledge and unbalanced knowledge. First we're going to look at lack of knowledge. The most prevalent factor is that many Christians do not know the truth concerning their union with the Lord Jesus in his death, burial, resurrection and ascension. All know about his substitution for them, but too few realise their identification with him. This is mainly due to the fact that the identification truths have long been neglected teaching in schools and churches and homes. And next there's misapplied knowledge. There are others, less numerous, but others who know their participation in this aspect of the work of the cross However, after reckoning upon their identification with Christ, they set about to produce its result by their own self-effort. It isn't readily understood that only the Holy Spirit can make experiential in us that which is already true of us in Christ. It is his specific ministry to apply the death of the cross to the old man and then to develop the life of the Lord Jesus in the new man. Our responsibility and privilege is to exercise faith, to exercise faith in the fact of our identification and to walk in dependence on the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verses 1 and 2. We read, walk in the Spirit and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, in Galatians 5, 16. Walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled by and guided by the Spirit. Then you will not gratify the cravings and the desires of the flesh. Thirdly, there's unbalanced knowledge. Still others are saying that in their hungry hearts, I know now that I have died to the old nature on the cross of the Lord Jesus, 
and I confidently reckon upon that liberating truth. But I'm not so clear about the second half of the reckoning. I seem to know more about the work of the cross than I do about the new life in the risen Christ. Oh, well, be encouraged, believer. Take one thing at a time. The cross does come first. Death to the old precedes the manifestation of life in the new. The years of struggle and failure haven't been wasted, but have been governed by his loving hand to prepare the hungry heart for the blessed exchange. By means of his processing, there comes a time when the failing believer begins to realise that living in and relying upon the old nature is sin, not just a, a disappointing inconvenience. Living in the old Adam life is illegal cohabitation. It is actually spiritual adultery. The believer has been married to another even to him that has been raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God, Romans 7 verse 4. He has to learn that in the old fleshly nature dwelleth no good thing, and that even its so-called righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Romans 7 verse 18, and also Isaiah 64 verse 6. So next we look at exchange. This all-important realisation provides the necessary hatred of the old man and the desire not for change but for exchange. The horrible old relinquished for the holy new. But what about this life in Christ Jesus? In him we are totally recreated, not just new creatures. Remember that in the tomb we were dead. Then, in Christ risen, we were totally regenerated, not just renovated. A butterfly is a new creature, not a new creation. But our new life and nature are completely new creations of God. All things are become new, and all things are of God. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 and 18. Next, knowing the old, and then we look at knowing the new. Knowing the old. When the Christian's knowledge of Christ in his new life is insufficient or in error, he more or less abides in the old nature because that's the best that he knows. Oh, how tragic. His mind and his life are centred in that sphere. Is that not where most believers are today? Oh, they are woefully aware of their sinfulness, of the old life within, but they are hung up there. Even so, the Holy Spirit sees to it that this realm of existence becomes unbearable. The work of the cross has enabled them to be free from the domination of the old man, yet they're still paying attention to it. The more they dwell on that source, the more it is activated. And its one byproduct is no good thing, is nothing but sin. Oh, they must let the truth of their position, overwhelm the feeling of their condition. And so lastly we look at knowing the new. When the old life within becomes intolerable, it's time to become acquainted with the new. Oh, unhappy and pitiable and wretched man that I am, writes Paul. Who will release and deliver me from the shackles of this body of death? Oh, thank God, he will, through Jesus Christ. Romans 7, verses 24 and 25. There is the key, knowing the new. 
It was not for nothing that John said in chapter 17, verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And nor that Paul exclaimed, that I may know him, in Philippians 3, verse 10. How do we come to know Christ as our very life? Is it by the word, and that by the Spirit? The Lord Jesus said, I am the truth. He said to his Father, Thy word is truth. And he said of the Spirit, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. John 14, verse 6, chapter 17, verse 17, and chapter 16, verse 13. If we leave the realm of the Spirit, wrought and talked word of truth, in an effort to know Christ more personally, some seeming angel of light, some denizen of the dark, or an overheated imagination will have us thrilling over a Jesus who is not the Christ. And many today are thus led astray. Then too, for many Christians, their knowledge of God and their attitude towards him are based on and controlled by circumstances and or by their personal condition, rather than by the word of God. They judge him by what they feel he is doing for them, or seemingly is not doing for them. Self-centred, they complain and they flounder from failure to failure. But when our knowledge of the Father is Bible-based, we're able to evaluate our circumstances and our personal condition in the light of who He is. Oh, then there is rest and joy in Him, no matter what the situation may be. To know Him is to trust Him and to love Him. Calvary is the proof of His love for us. Even if there were no other indication, or if all other indications were to the contrary. Whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans chapter 8, verses 30 to 32. It is natural for the believer's mind to become fixed on the old nature within because that has always been his life. But now it is sin to do so. Now he has a new life and a new nature and a renewed mind. And he has been freed from the old so that he can dwell on and abide in the new. To think in the realms of the old brings forth sin and death. But to think on the new results in righteousness and life. Paul, in the word of truth, exhorts us, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4 verse 8. Actually all of these things, in their highest essence and reality, are centred in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. As I rely on what the cross has already done with the old man, 
I am free as a new man to become intimately acquainted with the Lord Jesus. I am thereby rested in the very process that conforms me into his image.